Good morning. Uh, today as we go to our hymnal and song, our first hymn will be number 128, which is I Sing the Mighty Power of God. This was uh, written by Isaac Watts and was originally titled as Praise for Creation and Providence in a children's hymnal because Watts strongly believed in teaching children about even like more general concepts like just the mighty power of God. He was inspired by Ephesians 5.19 about speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord in order to remind children and each other about the power of God. Now let's all stand together and sing, I sing the mighty power of God. Thank you very, very much, and welcome. Hope you've had a good week. Glad you're here. Glad you're here with a Bible. I'm glad you're ready to find with me 1 John, 3rd chapter. 1 John, 3rd chapter. Have you ever tried to illustrate a Christian... When was the last time you enjoyed a nice cup of tea? You all know I drink tea. I drink a fair amount of it. What's the difference between the tea bag and the water now that the tea is in the water? Well, they're both tea. So there's no real difference, right? Well, the tea concept is really a picture of you and your Lord now that you have become a believer in Christ. You become a believer in the Savior of the world. You become a believer in the forgiver of all of your sins. You are now in Him and He is in you. Jesus said it this way. He says, At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, ye in me, and I in you. It's simple, but it's also profound at the same time. 
because his righteousness, his life, his love are, for lack of a better term, being squeezed out into you and through you to those around you. So you haven't merely received his life and his righteousness and his love. You experience his righteousness and his life and his love because you're in him and he's in you. I've noticed in my experience with tea that it's always a good idea when it's good boiling hot water to keep that tea bag going up and down. Does anybody know why I take that tea bag and keep dipping it up and down? It's simple, isn't it? It's because I want the tea in the tea bag in the water. Think how simple the concept is. I'm saying because you are the tea of Christ. And I want you to think about how marvelous it is. I can't say as I fully understand it, but I can say that I am one with him. Here's what he said in his prayer. Listen to Jesus in his prayer. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word. That's me. And that's you. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they may also be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which you gave me, I've given them. That they may be one even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and has loved me as you love them as you have loved me. So, would you with me this morning see one, the union, one, we are one with him. Maybe by the time I'm done, in just a minute or so, I'll have some really nice dark tea. One. I am one with Christ, and Christ is one with me. So, I want you to think a little bit about this today. I've got a topic on my heart this morning. I've titled the message, I've Got Confidence. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the gift of eternal life in Christ. Thank you that you sent your Son to live in us, to live in me, Lord. Thank you that I, that we, are one with him and that he has come to live in us, that we indeed would be one in Christ. You've given us his righteousness. You've given us his life. You've given us his love. Teach us today, Lord, to walk in the assurance of these things. Teach me, Lord, to believe your word. Every single thing to believe it. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. So, John, how do you know that you are in him and he is in you? Again, with your Bible in hand, 1 John and verse 19. How do you know, John? Verse 19. Hereby, by this, we know. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So what really, in part, is on my heart today is this matter of assurance. It's a big thing to be sure. He says there, you can assure your heart before him. Look again, verse 19. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So back up to verse number 16. Look at 16, 1 John 3, 16. Hereby, by this, we perceive the love of God 
because he laid down his life for, for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has this world good sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby, by this, we know that we're of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he's given us commandment. He that keeps his commands dwells in him and he in them. Hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. So today, pure tea. Spiritual tea. You all know exactly what happens when you dip the bag into the cup of water. Would you consider with me, please, the spiritual tea of the Lord Jesus Christ who's living in you as a believer in Christ? I have three words on my heart today. Three words. Three words of encouragement. Three words from your Bible. Three words written by John, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The first one being this one, assurance. It's nice to be sure. It's nice to be sure. Isn't it nice to be sure? Do you like it when you're sure? I'm sure about my name. I'm sure that I'm married. I'm sure I've got children. I'm sure of a lot of things. But you know one of the things that many Christians are not so sure of? They're not so sure that they are saved. They believed on Jesus. Somebody told them that you could be completely forgiven of all your sins. The Bible gives us a word on how to assure our hearts before him. It specifically says the following, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. Hereby we know that we are of the truth, watch carefully, and shall assure our hearts before him. Well, by the way, this little word assure here is interesting because it, it's found another place or two in the Bible. And it actually means to be persuaded. When you're sure of something, you're persuaded by it. And if you remember the story here, let me just give you the quick story here. Then said Jesus unto them, resurrection morning, don't be afraid. Go tell my brethren that are in Galilee. There you'll see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch, they are the guard, came into the city and they showed the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave the soldiers, they gave the guard money, saying, say to that uh, his disciples came at night and stole him while we slept. And if this comes to Pilate's ears, the governor, we will persuade him and secure you. Same word that we found in 1 John chapter 3. When the men who were guarding the tomb of Jesus realized that he'd risen from the dead, they took the news to the chief priest, and the chief priest said what? Don't tell anybody we're going to pay you some money. If the news comes to the Pontius Pilate's ears, we'll take care of that. Listen, if I am sure of my salvation in Jesus Christ, I've been persuaded by something. And the Bible tells us what we can be persuaded by. 
So I don't know what's happening with your life. I know you've got goods, and I know you've got possessions, and I know you've got material blessings, but are you serving the poor? Look again what the scripture says. By this, we assure our hearts that we are in him. You see, it's giving you assurance of your relationship to him. Now, no giving to the poor, no true connection to him. Really? What does the Bible say? Giving out of your abundance to those in need, you show his love and you are assured you know that you are in union with Jesus Christ. Now take this one step a little further. There are some of you, not me, but there are some of you, not me, who like to put milk and sugar in their tea. Right? Some people. And that's adding flavor. But may I say something to you today? Sometimes the added things in our Christian life hinder the tea from coming out so it's beautiful for those around us. All of the other stuff that we have in our lives. And people miss Jesus because we've got all this other stuff. You see, all of that might be hindering the fact of the Lord's life being squeezed out of you, squeezed out of Him into you for the benefit of other people. Take away some of those things. Give to those who are in need, out of your abundance. His love flows through you to them. What does the Bible say? Hereby, by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. You know, there are plenty of us, and I say us meaning us believers, Christians. We think that we have this, well, I'm sure I'm saved. I'm sure I'm saved. It's mystical. It's just, I'm sure I'm saved. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says you assure your heart before him in an act of giving. You're saved by faith, but you're sure by giving. Is that what it says there? What's it say in your Bible? I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. But when I give out of my abundance to those that are in need, the Bible says I assure my heart before him. You know, I do think there's a lot of the Christian life is missed when we miss out on the simple things. Don't you think that many of us make it so complicated? We have all of this other stuff. Look for assurance of your salvation in the right place. First, assurance. Second, God promises he will answer your prayers. I think this is so marvelous. I just want to tell you how marvelous it is. You see, he says here, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have boldness toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Can I say to you, please let the tea of the person of Jesus be squeezed out of him into you to the benefit of the people around you. It's wonderful to know the words of Christ. It's wonderful to know that the tea of the person of Jesus is in me. I am in him, and he's in me. That's the simple, wonderful, glorious truth of being a Christian. But not only does he want you to be sure of your salvation, he wants you to learn the glory of resting in his promises on the matter of prayer. How much of prayer is teaching you to have greater confidence in God? How much of prayer 
in your personal life is teaching you to have a greater confidence in God. Listen, folks. All your struggles in prayer, all your education in prayer, all of this is so that you will learn to trust His promises regarding prayer. You see, it's not the prayer or even the praying that is the most important. It's the relationship. You trust Him because He made the promise. He says in His Word, whatsoever you ask, I will do. So you're now fully enjoying your tea, His life, His righteousness, His love are flowing into you and to others around you. Now you ask for something, and what does He say? He promises to answer you. You see that that's the normal Christian life? He wants you to trust Him. It's the daily experience of the Christian that makes all the difference. It's the daily experience of the Christian who is leaning upon the promises of God. The daily experience, walking with Him, knowing Him, seeing Him change things and people around you because you have come before Him in prayer. Seeing Him change you because you're taking those things to Him in prayer. Believing the promises that He has made. Folks, if there's something in your life right now that you need, we have a whole church of needless people. Nobody needs anything here. Let me ask it again. Is there anybody here that needs anything? If you need anything, there is one place that you can go to get that need met. Listen to Jesus Hold on to the promise. Learn to trust the promises of God when it comes to prayer. Look what the scripture says. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Really? If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Matthew 7, 7. Ask. It will be given you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks, receives. He that seeks, finds. To him that knocks, it shall be opened. What man of you is there, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? If he asks fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to those that ask Him? I think this might just be the greatest promise in the whole Bible. I think this just might be the greatest promise that the Lord has ever made. If there's something that will strengthen you, something that will encourage you, something that will lift you up, it's asking the Lord for something while believing that He is the one that will provide it. Did you notice that the Lord compares Himself to us when it comes to prayer? Look again. If you then, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to those that ask Him? Listen, He is a dad. He is a good dad. He is a dad that knows exactly what you need. And practically speaking, when His child comes to Him, He will not turn you away. You see, God never ignores his children. He's never too busy. He's never lacking in resources. He's never confused. He's never ill-disposed. He's always attentive, always gracious, always eager, always wise, always loving. He hears every request from his humble, trusting children. And he answers with whatever is best 
It always pays to pray. So, says John, the Lord made you a promise that is above and beyond anyone else's promise. Whatever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Prayer supported and surrounded by a surrendered heart, by a believing heart, yields fruit above and beyond our expectation. You see, when you pray, you're leaning on somebody else's words. You did know that, right? When you pray, you're leaning on somebody else's words. It's not your great ability to pray. It's not your wonderful words when you pray. Did you notice John adds this one powerful adjustment to your prayer life here? He wants your heart. The Lord wants you to trust Him when you pray. That's how important your personal growth in prayer is. He wants you to learn to rely upon His promises. What does He say? So what is prayer? Prayer is leaning upon somebody else's words. Now there are some of us who think the Lord should give us exactly what we want every single time that we ask Him and then after all we say to God and we know in our heart we need this. I need this. (laughs) But practically speaking dads, moms, have you not done that every single time your child asks for something? Every single thing they asked for, what did you do? Right? You gave them everything they asked for. He's 16 now. He wants his license. You give him his license. Now he's 16 and a half years old and he wants a Maserati. And so what do you say? You give him a Maserati. True? That's the way it works when you ask your parent, right? That's exact, Isn't it? I don't see anybody shaking their head with me. Listen, folks, do you think God is a wise father? Do you think God knows what you're asking for? And sometimes when you ask for stuff, he doesn't give it the way or the when because he knows it's not going to be the best for you. Every dad and mom knows that. What's the difference? Your child comes humbly to you. Your child comes very respectfully to you. Your child comes to you and he says, I heard you say, Dad. Ah! Now it's a little different level now. I heard you say, Dad. You see, when you walk with the Lord, you have an awareness that he has made a promise to you personally. Now when you make your request, you're praying based upon what somebody else has said. Please, folks, don't stand in judgment of God. Some people think that they have prayed prayers for years and God has not yet answered their prayer. So why should I keep on praying? After all, I've been praying for a lot of years. Wait, 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 wait. You're going to judge God? When you pray because He didn't give you what you requested? When you requested? By the way, for those of you who have read your Bible, there's David. Anybody know what David said about praying? How about Daniel? How about Abraham? How about Paul? How about Peter? Abraham, father of us all, Abraham was the one God gave him a specific promise. He said, you're going to have a son, and out of your son's going to come all of the, as many as the stars in heaven, as many as the sands on the seashore, descendants. Any idea how long it took for Abraham to have one son? Anybody know how long it was? It was 25 years. You're not going to pray. You are not going to pray for 25 years, right? That is not going to happen with you. Terry Williams. Year after year, mom prayed for Terry. He abused drugs. He was in and out of jail. He showed no signs of ever wanting to know Christ. The days dragged on, the months and the years dragged on, no indication that anything different in Terry Williams' life. Then one day, 
28 years after mom began praying for Terry. Terry heard the good news and he heard the good news and he put his trust in Christ. And you know what Terry's doing today from prison? He's telling other prisoners about Jesus Christ. Of course, mom could have given up on year 27, right? But she didn't. There's a wonderful story in a book called A Praying Life by Paul Miller about a mother who prayed for 25 years that her daughter would speak. Every time the family got together, they'd have prayer together. They knew what mom was going to pray. They're going to, she's going to pray that our daughter would speak. Did you know her daughter finally spoke when she was 25 years old? Then there are those times when we pray and immediately God answers. Here's an example of that. Here's Hudson Taylor. He's on his way to China the first time. And it says this, One definite answer to prayer under such circumstances was a great encouragement to Taylor's faith. They had just come through the Dampier Strait. This, this is Indonesia area. But were not yet out of sight of the islands. Usually, a breeze would spring up after sunset and last until about dawn. The utmost use was made of it, but during the day, they lay still with flapping sails. You know that's pretty common around the equator. They call it the doldrums because often the wind falls off and ships in those days that depended on the wind, they didn't move. They were basically stuck in the currents. And so what would happen is at night they would blow forward. In the day the wind would stop and the current would pull them back. Can you imagine that? You sail so far, then the wind stops and it pulls you back. And then the next day you say the next night you sail forward, next day you drop back. And you just make a little headway. You go a little further but what happened is this. This happened notably on one occasion when we were in dangerous proximity to the north of New Guinea. Saturday night had brought us to a point some 30 miles off the land. And during the Sunday morning service, which was held on deck, I could not fail to see that the captain looked troubled, frequently went over to the side of the ship, when the service was ended, I learnt from him the cause. A four-knot current was carrying us toward some sunken reefs, and we were already so near that it seemed improbable that we should get that it seemed improbable that we should get through the afternoon in safety. After dinner, the longboat was put out, and all hands endeavored, without success, to turn the ship's head from the shore. After standing together on the deck for some time in silence, the captain said to me, Well, we've done everything that can be done. We can only await the result. A thought occurred to me, said Taylor, and I replied, No, there's one thing we have not done yet. What's that, he queried. Four of us on board are Christians. Let us each retire to his own cabin and in agreed prayer ask the Lord to give us immediately a breeze. He can as easily send it now as at sunset. The captain complied, because he was one of the Christians, with this proposal. I went and spoke to the other two men, and after prayer with the carpenter, we all four retired to wait upon God. I had a good but very brief season in prayer, and then felt so satisfied that our request was granted that I could not continue asking and very soon went up again on deck. The first officer, a godless man, was in charge. I went over and asked him to let down the clues or corners of the mainsail, which had been drawn up in order to lessen the useless flapping of the sail against the rigging. What would be the good of that, he answered roughly. I told him we had been asking a wind from God, 
that it was coming immediately, and we were so near the reef by this time that there was not a minute to lose. With an oath and a look of contempt, he said he would rather see a wind than hear of it. But while he was speaking, I watched his eye, following it up to the royal, and there, sure enough, the corner of the topmost sail was beginning to tremble in the breeze. Don't you see the wind is coming? Look at the royal, I exclaimed. No, it's only a cat's paw, he rejoined, a mere puff of wind. Cat's paw or not, I cried. Pray let down the mainsail and give us the benefit. This he was not slow to do. In another minute, the heavy tread of the men on deck brought up the captain from his cabin to see what was the matter. The breeze had indeed come. In a few minutes, we were plowing our way at six or seven knots an hour through the water. And though the wind was sometimes unsteady, we did not altogether lose it until after passing the Pelu Islands. Thus God encouraged me ere landing on China's shores to bring every variety of need to him in prayer and to expect that he would honor the name of the Lord Jesus and give the help each emergency required. And I only read that because it's like I was saying before, something in us knows there is benefit to having a number of Christians. I mean, isn't it true? You see, the Lord's given to us promises. And sometimes it takes 25 years. Sometimes it's immediate. But as I say, prayer is learning to depend on somebody else's words. So please don't judge the Lord when he doesn't answer the way you would like him to answer. There's one more thing I would like to share with you, and that is from verse number 24. Look with me at verse number 24. He that keeps his commandment dwells in him and he in him. And hereby, by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given to us. Some people think that there's this secret that only a few people know about what it means to really walk with God. But do you know that the Bible tells us that you have the Holy Spirit living in you? You've got this assurance of your salvation. You've got the promise of God to answer your prayers, every one of them. But you've also got this matter of abiding in Christ because the Spirit lives in you. I want you to think about how marvelous it is. Hereby we know that He abides in us by the Spirit that He has given to us. Of all the things that the Lord has blessed us with, folks, the Holy Spirit living within us must be among the most important things that God ever gave us. You see, when a person is relying upon Him, you rely upon Him and not yourself and not the things in this world. You rely upon Him because He is the living God, He is the living Savior, and His Word is the living Word. He says here, by this we know that He abides in us by His Spirit that He has given to us. I know what the Bible says. I know that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. But the joy of the Christian life is learning to abide in Him and let the tea of Christ be squeezed out of Him into me and into the people that are around me. You see what the Lord is really after? The Lord is really after you learning to depend upon Him. One thing that is the most important thing that I'm learning in my walk with the Lord. I can't say as I fully understand what it means to abide in Christ. But I can say this. When I know that my Heavenly Father is working everything together for good in my life. And I sense in my heart that everything that God has brought in my life is so that I can learn to depend upon Him 
then he is blessed. He is blessed when I am responding to God's working all the things in my life together. And in your life it's different than it is in my life. But folks, to learn to abide in him in every single circumstance, with every single person, with every single problem, is to learn to trust him. His spirit will give you the sense that you are indeed his own. I want, do you want, do we want, do we not need that the tea of Christ be squeezed out into us and into the people around us? It happens when we abide in him. When you put your trust in the right person, Solomon said it like this in Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Stop leaning on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. I have three words of encouragement for you today. Assurance. The promises of God and abiding in Christ. I don't know, folks, if there's anything more wonderful than to know that God wants our lives to be so blessed that we are a blessing to him. Whatever's going on in your home, whatever's going on in your job, whatever's going on in your heart today, he wants you to have assurance, he wants you to have confidence in prayer, and he wants you to abide in him. So, of course, my question is always the same. What are you going to do with his word? What are you going to do with these words today? Here's the prayer. Why not you pray along with me today, Lord? Thank you for a free salvation. Thank you for these encouragements. I know you want us to be sure to believe your promises when we pray and to abide in you. Lord, today I choose all three and thank you that my part is to rest in your power to keep me close to you. Right now I'm trusting. Right now I'm resting. Right now I'm abiding in you. Thank you for a wonderful Savior in the Lord Jesus. Father, you know our hearts. We are so glad, Lord. You know all things. And we thank you, Lord, for each one of us we can say with absolute certainty we know that you are working everything together for good to those that love you, to those that are the called according to your purpose. Father, we ask that you will take these precious words this morning, apply them to our hearts, Lord. Help us to listen to you, to lean upon you, Lord to let you accomplish in us today what you want to accomplish. And that, Father, our lives will indeed be a blessing to others and to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. And here is an absolute beautiful song that we're going to sing in closing. Number 572. Would you find it with me, please, in your hymnal? And lift up your voice and sing today. Blessed assurance. Let's stand together and sing, shall we? 572. Sing with me, please. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation.
If we can be of further help to you in your Christian life, which we'd like to be, please contact us at ebcsaybrook.com or by phone, 860-388-2582.